hey, I've just been reading this book through a couple of times by Timothy Peranick and Michael Ferris. It's titled Vaccination, Biblical Revelation, Ellen G. White, Science and History. And this is a book from 2017. So the authors of this book aren't reacting to COVID-19 or any machinations surrounding that. They're just reacting to the issue of vaccination. So Peranick and Ferris are pretty concerned about a statement that was voted by the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 2015. This statement calls on church members to participate responsibly in vaccination programs. And the authors are suitably concerned about this. They say there's no religious or faith-based reason not to participate in vaccination. So now Peranick and Ferris respond to the claims made in this statement, uh, claims that the Bible and Ellen White support vaccination and that the peer-reviewed scientific literature supports vaccination. And they argue quite to the contrary on the first two items, and they do it very effectively. I'm not going to cover those arguments here, but you might have a misunderstanding of the history and of what did and didn't happen. So I would definitely encourage you to look at their arguments there. They're very strong. And those arguments contradict the voted statement. But I want to look at that third area with you for a minute, the area of peer-reviewed scientific literature. One of the things they do in this book that I found interesting was they give you a lot of reasons to be very wary of the peer-reviewed scientific literature. Now, you should know that these are medical, these are trained medical, degreed medical specialists. So they have a scientific basis for their opinions. They're not anti-science. So now on page 100, the authors point out that peer-reviewed scientific literature is not immune to conflict of interest, fraud, or deceit. In fact, when you look at these medical journals, most of the research is funded by corporations of vast, almost indescribable wealth. For example, the authors quote Richard Horton, editor of The Lancet. You might have heard of The Lancet. It's a substantial medical journal. And here's what he says. Even scientific journals, supposedly the neutral arbiters of quality by virtue of their much vaunted process of critical peer review, are owned by publishers and scientific societies that derive and demand huge earnings from advertising by drug companies and from the sale of commercially valuable content. Another one they quote is Richard Smith, who edited the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, for 13 years. And he's got an article about peer-reviewed stuff. And what does he say? He says that although this is considered... The peer review process is considered a sacred process. I mean, that sounds kind of religious, doesn't it? He says that process is slow, expensive, ineffective, something of a lottery, prone to bias and abuse, and hopeless at spotting errors and fraud. A guy that's been editing the British Medical Journal for 13 years, and he says that the process is hopeless in terms of fraud in these things, that's kind of indicting, isn't it? Another item they point out is how Pfizer, you might have heard of them more recently, but they were fined $2.3 billion. That was in 2009, and they were bribing medical officials. If you read the book, one time I'll, I'll do a video here on Big Pharma, this very thick book I uh, just read while everything was closed down last year. And it goes through with an enormous amount of fraud, all kinds of stuff. They're, the fines, when they get fined billions of dollars, it doesn't mean anything to them because they're making so much money beyond that. But I want you to listen to this uh, extended description. This is page 102. Listen to this extended description by Professor David Kemperer on the review process. So he's talking about the peer review process that we trust all these medical things on. Here's what he says. There is no secret to how the desired results are fabricated. It is possible to give a study a spin into the desired direction at any stage of the research process. The results will differ according to what the research question is, which of the possible endpoints are included, which patients are included or excluded, what is being compared, and which study period is selected. In the evaluation, it is common practice to change primary and secondary endpoints without disclosure. Suppressing results that might constitute an obstacle to marketing a substance, as well as the reinterpretation of negative and unclear results as positive results, are further methods of manipulation. Pharmaceutical companies often leave both doctors and patients in the dark about the real effects of their products. The knowledge base on which we as doctors reach decisions with our patients is often distorted, and doctors thus often unwittingly put their patients at risk. Your doctor's not trying to put you at risk. But the research process, the marketing process, and the way that physicians decide to uh, prescribe this substance for you or that substance for you, he might not be getting the package he thought, and you might not be getting the package that you thought that he thought was real. If you can change the, the, change the data, you can manipulate the data within the study process, 
you can come up with lots of results. You know, don't forget the statistician who drowned in a lake that on average was three feet deep. Well, yeah, it might be on average three feet deep, but if you fall into a hole that's 50 feet deep, two thirds of the way across, you're gonna drown if you can't swim. Statistics can be easily manipulated. And especially when you're in an area where you're looking at expertise and then you and I maybe don't have that expertise. So it's a pretty nasty thing to find that the big dollar rules everything. And not only the big dollar, but maybe some issues of control. We want to control the bodies and souls of men. Uh, seems to be a going piece here for some of this. So now, so far, I've just given you quotes, quotes that Paradic and Ferris are, are pre presenting. But let me give you their exact words. Uh, listen to these questions they ask. This is 100 pages into the book. Why should people trust a medical system that uses censorship and suppresses natural medicine? Why should people trust medical journals which are unquestionably influenced by pharmaceutical companies? Why should people trust their lives and the lives of their children to vaccines produced by a pharmaceutical industry granted liability protection in a court of law? How is such legal immunity encouraging to an individual uncertain about vaccines, let alone compulsory vaccination? And uh, so, yeah, referring to the peer-reviewed scientific literature might not be really the end of this story. So now you might say, well, you know, well, we have to do something. We have to trust something. And peer-reviewed scientific journals are really all that we've got. I'm not saying that the peer review process is useless. What I'm saying, and I think the same thing that the authors are saying, is that it might not be quite as good and awesome as you and I might have thought and hoped it would be. In fact, there are many ways that data can be manipulated and we might not be getting the best information there that we thought we were. Mainstream medicine has, has done a lot for us. I mean, let's be, let's be fair-minded and honest here. But it isn't all that it's cracked up to be. One of the things I found to be most interesting about this book was uh, the section on different kinds of medicine. Chapter 3, History of Early Adventist Perspectives on Vaccination. And he goes through here and he lists out several different approaches. It's not just mainstream medicine out there. There is uh, homeopathy, osteopathy, herb, you know, herbology, eclectics, hygienic medicine, which actually sounds a lot more like the early Adventist medicine that we have in the, our understanding of the health principles. But a lot of these things have been superseded by, by uh, the enormously wealthy kind of mainstream medicine today. And this chapter alone uh, gives us a, quite an interesting perspective. It gives me an interesting perspective. I want things that's going to be consistent with the message of health and wholeness that the Bible promotes and that we as a people had quite a handle on in the first part of our time. But now we seem like we're trapped off in mainstream medicine and the big dollars. The history. This book has got a remarkable history there for us to give us a broader picture than we might have had without it. What I'm saying is that just as in the realm of biblical and theological questions where your, or your presuppositions and your baseline principles, if you get those wrong, you can get everything dramatically wrong, the same pertains to medicine. If your baseline principles aren't what they're supposed to be, you can land way over here in a very crazy place. And it's only your health at stake and the health of your family and children. So, so yeah, we should maybe take it pretty seriously. Can't we do better than just following along in the mainstream pattern when we've been given a a message, a remarkable health emphasis that uh, no other people really has been given quite the same way. Now, on their final page, the authors ask a pretty haunting question. Will the church protect the deeply held religious convictions of its members, both collectively and as individuals, or will it lend its weight toward the drug industry, organized medicine, and conventional wisdom? Page 172. And you know, that's an important question today. When refusal to go along with the master narrative is leading to suppression and the cancellation of careers. Are we really up for that? Are we going to just go along with that? Well, anyway, here's a question. I read many books, and there's a lot of them that I can't recommend. I cannot. What about this book? I recommend this book very highly. It's well-written. It's very readable. There are a couple of technical spots because of the nature of the discussion, but they're not too bad. They're not too bad at all. Very readable. The history in the book is sound. The position of this book is balanced. It's rational. It makes sense. It's consistent with Seventh-day Adventist and Bible principles of health, well-being, and Christianity. It's faithful to the principles on which the Seventh-day Adventist Church stands. I completely support the author's stand for this 2015 statement to be rewritten or corrected or, or thrown away 
it, it, on the surface, that statement looks kind of okay, but it's really a very pro-vaccination statement, and they say outright they won't support members in their religious convictions. That's a problem for me. Hey, we're a church family. We're a global church family, and we have been given a health message. How can we just abandon it at will? We may or may not agree on every point, certainly, but let's support each other's conscientious convictions and the rights that we have and the, the God-given responsibility we have to treat our bodies and the bodies of our children and family members rightly and not to just fall over and do whatever we're told to do. The statement needs to be changed. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church should aggressively support the conscientious convictions of its members to how they will treat their own bodies medically, even when it comes to the practice of vaccination. You know, it isn't right to just hear one side of the story. I would go so far as to say this is a book for this time. Heaven knew we would face this issue and provoke the authors to prepare this material and publish this all the way back. It was published in 2017. It's very timely for us today. And I believe this book provides information that Big Pharma and even some Adventist medical professionals don't want you to see, don't want you to think about, don't want you to consider. And so I would suggest you think about it, see it, and consider it, read the book. Wholehearted recommendation. Get the book. Vaccination, Biblical Revelation, LNG White, History, Science, and it is from Tim Peranick and Michael Ferris. Get it now.